Today we're at the Venkatesh project. We're talking framing, structural pathways, loads, and shear. I'm Dave Edwards. And I'm Patrick Diggin. And let's get to it. Pat, so we actually have a lot going on on this project. We have a little bit of every kind of roof. We have a little bit of every kind of wall. And I'd love for you to take us through kind of the, some of the different things that we're looking at here. So firstly, what I'm looking at is a truss roof. Mm -hmm. So explain to me a little bit about trusses because I know that a lot of our projects can take advantage of trusses, but only some of them do. And in green building, a truss is actually a really ad advantageous uh, structural member because we can use a lot smaller trees and it's engineered so we can actually do longer spans than we do on a stick frame uh, roof, which we'll talk about in a minute. And this project has both. Yep. So walk us through the trusses here. Yeah, absolutely. So a truss system is designed, something designed off site at a, at a plant and they bring them onto the project. So already assembled and Already built. assembled. So okay. if, you, if you kind of take a look up, what you can see is you have these engineered trusses and what they do is they have nail plates and all the loads are calculated. They do go through their calculations and they press these together and you could create large spans, um, you know, for every specification possible. So the nail plates are those little metal squares or rectangles and they look like they have slots in them. That's correct. But it's actually not a slot. It's a it's actually, they take in the metal and bent it inward so it looks like a, a spiky plate. Exactly. And then they press that into the wood and that brings together pieces of wood maybe that are perpendicular to each other in a structurally sound way that you typically can't build, put wood together. That's correct. So basically they press those plates on and it's like having 25, 30 nails, all in a concentrated area. Oh, got it. Yeah. So when they put these trusses in, the, the way that they work is they, the load carries out to the exterior walls. So your bearing points are on both sides of the room. It gives you the, the opportunity and capability to have a completely wide open room or your intermediate partitions are just not load bearing. So which, these walls don't serve a structural function for holding up the roof. Basically, they're just holding up sheetrock and doors. That's correct. Just, just to be a partition between one room through the other. So at some point in the future, if we're using trusses, we can actually take this whole wall out and it doesn't matter at all structurally. Yes, with no consequence, no, no re-engineering or anything like that. So then why aren't all houses built that way? Well, I, I just really think it, it, it varies upon design and, and intent, okay. um, but they're very versatile. You could, have, you could have big vaulted areas, scissor trusses, where you have your, your exterior pitch of the roof. Um, in order to incorporate that, you'd have to have the interior side a little sh more shallow of okay. a pitch, but there's, there's endless options. Of so you literally can have a vaulted ceiling in a truss roof. So you have an outside roof and an inside roof, and it's, the truss is kind of shaped like this. That's correct. And, and it's still putting all the weight on the outside walls. That's correct. And uh, another, another nice thing is when you do trusses, say if you have a drop ceiling, your bottom cord acts as the ceiling joist as well. Oh, so okay. you have, you're, you're doing basically your ceiling joist and your roof all in one. Okay. So that's a big time saver in factor right okay. there. Okay. So I see this truss with a lot of these diagonal bracing uh, called cords. But then I see right next to them, the trusses really have this huge open space. So what is that huge open space? So yeah, that, you're absolutely right about that. What we have here is in the design of trusses, you could, you could open up a space and design a space to have attic. So, so you can actually have attic space in a truss roof. That's correct. So it's just design, you specify whatever area you would like to have that, and they will incorporate that into the design. So again, similar to like what we did down below or what uh, you did down below is we actually took space that would be an occupied mm -hmm. by structure yep. and lost and we've made it functional storage space for the clients. That's correct. And so up in this location, we're actually gonna be putting our air handlers up here for the different, um, for the different zones. Okay. So it's just gonna, we're gonna utilize this space for uh, mostly for um, just our HVAC system. Okay. And then I noticed that we don't have any holes in the eave blocks here. So that to me 
tells us that we're doing an unvented attic assembly. That's correct. So this will be a conditioned attic. So everything we're going to be using closed cell foam up uh, um, onto the bottom side of the plywood of the roof sheathing. Okay. So it eliminates all, all ventilation. It also helps, you know, it could be used as an airtight barrier, even though we're using an uh, air, air barrier on the exterior as well. Right. It's just one more. A safety know, margin. Yeah, safety okay. margin. And, um, you know, you, with that closed cell foam, you could also increase um, the R value without having gotcha. such an expansive foam. Got it. And then we're going to put our HVAC system up there. So now the HVAC system, the heating and cooling system of the house is within the conditioned space. So now any leakage and actually the unit itself heating up or cooling down in the summertime will actually go to condition the rest of the house. That's correct. And it's going to make them run that much more efficient, right? Because you're not in an attic that's 130 degrees in the summer. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, always yeah, a good thing, right. right? Okay. So now the whole house here though, isn't trusses. That's correct. We actually have stick frame uh, built roof in the other part of the upstairs. So we're going to take a look at that right now. So Pat, we're now in the kitchen because this is a much easier and actually much more impressive space. And I see that we in fact don't have trusses here. We have a lot of, of what looks like about two by 10 and then a big ridge beam that kind of crosses this space. And this must be 30 feet across. So tell us a little bit about what's going on here uh, and also you know, what physics are we having to consider when we build a space like this? Yes, absolutely. So in this scenario with a vaulted ceiling, one thing that you have to counteract is the, the force of gravity pushing the, the rafters, spreading them apart. So on a traditional roof system with that st stick frame, you usually would have say ceiling joists going across. And what that's gonna do is it's going to span from the one wall of the exterior to the other and creating basically a collar tie. A collar so what's tie, a collar tie? So a collar tie, basically it, it's connected to both sides of the exterior walls. It's most almost always nailed to the side of the rafter and that stops the separation and outward forces from pushing those exterior walls and making them. So bump. gravity is pulling the, the roof down and that's pushing the, the walls away. So if you don't have some way of resisting the walls falling away from the roof or away from each other, mm -hmm. which is the collar tie. So that collar tie is a wood piece of uh, a member that is in tension. So it's constantly being pulled by the outward thrust of the walls. That's correct. And so the ridge beam is there to kind of support the center of the ridge. So now, uh, when the ridge beam can't drop because there's a ridge beam, the walls don't move out so we don't need collar ties. That's correct. Okay, so now most of the load on this is in the middle of the roof, which means that we need to support that because there's no walls or any support here. Yep. So all of the load for that comes onto this wall right here in the middle and this wall right here in the middle. We have giant windows here. That's right. So what are we doing to, to get rid of that load and put it onto some place that's not a window? So what we have is we have um, the structural engineer make sure that the load is capable on that header is capable of supporting that ridge beam. So, um, so where's the header here? Because I, I don't see headers here. Well, what we have in both scenarios is kind of harder to see because of the unique windows we had to frame with plywood and create this radius. So it's within that wall, we have a header. So it's a big beam. It's exactly, that. we have a beam going across. And if you look over here, you could see where then the load is transferred down to each side of the window onto a post here and, and a here. post right there. So we have a beam way up there that's behind the plywood that's carrying all the load from this other beam onto those posts and then those posts come down and they're sitting right here. That's correct. And, and then, so what are these sitting on? So this sits on the perimeter foundation, the stem walls of the foundation and transfer those load all the way down through the foundation. So all the time uh, we're talking about taking loads. So taking weight essentially from the top of the roof all the way down and it always has to sit on foundation. That's correct. Right? Because if we don't have it sit on foundation, then we're going to be deflecting the floors and causing all kinds of potential risks later on. Yep. So as we talked, this is a vertical load, right? Now we also have other loads. We have horizontal loads from earthquakes and strong winds. How do we deal with those situations? So for uh, lateral movement and the horizontal load, 
we come into a situation like this where we have a structural shear wall, which consists of studs and plywood and a certain nailing pattern. So as you can see right here, this is representative of what this shear wall contains of. It has our length, which is 12 foot by nine inches. Right. And then we have our nailing schedule, which is six inches on the edges and 12 inches in the field. So at the edge of every piece of plywood, we have to have a nail no longer than six inches from the next nail. That's correct. And then anytime in the field. So this is the edge nailing, which is the first number. And then the field nailing is the inside this four by eight sheet of plywood. And sometimes they come longer, but typically it's four by eight sheets. And that's 12 inches on center. So these nails are 12 inches on center. That's correct. And then the whole wall is 12 feet, nine inches long. That is correct. And so if we build a wall that's 12 feet, seven inches long, we actually have to fix that. We have to fix that. Or the other thing is you have to go back and have the calculations run by the engineer to see if it still meets the specifications. Okay, so now there's a whole lot of nails in here. And I understand that the nailing pattern is determined by the structural engineer. Mm -hmm. So the more nails, the stronger the shear wall. That is correct. Right? But we have a limit as to how many nails we can put into a specific material, right? Like you can't put 100 nails in this little section because you'll blow apart the, the, the wood behind this, right? That's right. So. We're, we're getting that information from the structural engineer. Is are this a structural engineer saying, okay, this has to be a six by six, and this has to be a two by t uh, four, and this has to be a three by four because it has more nails? Are they getting that specific? Absolutely. So it all depends on which kind of shear wall is, is called out by the engineer. A lot of the times there'll be, you know, five to eight different shear walls with shear ratings. Um, and a spread around the project. So a project correct. doesn't just a project doesn't just have one type of shear wall. It has all different types of shear wall depending on the loads on that specific portion of the roof. That's correct. And the, the higher rating of the shear wall, the components will be at a little a little bit different. So if you have a higher rated shear wall instead of six inches on the edge, if it were to be say four, three, or two inches, wow. what's going to be required is instead of using a two by four at your edge nailing on vertically and horizontally, they're going to up that to a three by or a four by member. So it'll either be wow. a two and a half or a three and a half inch thick member. Okay. So it's just, you get too many nails into your standard um, edge nailing pattern. You have, to, you have to widen that wood member. Wow. And so now we have in this circumstance, we have this big, long, wide wall. And we know that this is taking a lot of the load in this dimension. So if an earthquake was to come this direction, this wall would support this portion of the house from falling down on an earthquake. But what happens if we don't have a big wide wall? Like what happens if we have a really small wall? Cause I noticed behind us, we have a wall that, or a, a section of wall with a big opening in it. That's right. And that big opening doesn't allow us to have a 12 foot, nine inch wide uh, shear wall. So what are we doing here? Cause I see something that I haven't seen anywhere else on this project. So explain to us what's going on on this wall. So at this location, what we have is we have an engineered shear panel. So this is made offsite a facility um, and it's called out by the, uh, by the structural engineer. And this is able to give us an extreme amount of lateral shear value in a small package. So a lot of the times you'll have these at large door portals or garage portals where you don't have much wall on the edges, but you want a large expanse of an opening. And so the structural engineer, I mean, that is literally a solid piece of material with two ginormous metal plates in it with what must be 80 nails per plate connected to enormous bolts with enormous washers. I mean, that whole yep. thing is incredible. Do we have to do anything special with the foundation underneath that? Absolutely. So um, there's cross sections and details for these panels. Um, you need special connectors for the all thread. It's a seven eighth inch diameter all thread. That and means a, a, a bolt seven eighths inch in diameter. So that big around. Yes. And that goes down roughly 60 inches or more. Um, and at six the, zero inches, six zero. So five feet down into the stem wall. So that's, it's going in through five feet of concrete. That is correct. In order to give it enough strength to withstand the load that that wall is placing on it. Just because we have a big wall 
with almost no shear wall. That is correct. Wow. Um, it also has another detail where you have to run, um, it's called pins, which is basically a rebar sections horizontally in between each one of those um, all threads. So there's pinning that goes and that's all tied together and it has a large plate washer which is a big square piece of metal with a nut on the bottom on the very bottom of this um, each of the all threads. So that way with any uplift no matter what it cannot it cannot move and it'll stay rigid. So, so not only do we have five feet of concrete we have enormous bolts with enormous washers, and then we have a lot of rebar just in that one area, just to handle the load that earthquakes put on it because that wall is so short. That's correct. And we have two of them, one on each side of this doorway. Yep. And that's all defined by the structural engineer. Yes. De per your area, per you know how, how susceptible your area is, how close you are to a fault line, and all of those details are taken into consideration. So all of that is given to us fairly late in the project. I mean, before the, the project gets submitted to, to the planning and permitting, uh, they have to get structural engineering. But very often, these things are considered late in the design process. And the structural engineer really has to come in and say, okay, based on where we are in the fault zone, or maybe if you're in hurricane area or tornado area, what are the forces on that building? And then I have to resist all those forces. So I start at the top and go down to the bottom for gravity loads. And then I talk about the kind of dimensions of every wall in, with respect to earthquakes or hurricanes or anything like that. That's right. They have a, they have a challenging job because usually the design is priority. And it's their job to incorporate the structural components around that design. So. And what we've seen, and, and this is, I think, something really important for building science, but also green building, is that if you don't get a structural engineer that pays attention to how much things cost, you can get a structural engineer that puts a lot of extra money into these buildings as a safety protection. So maybe you need these really expensive shear walls in this wall because you have essentially a big wall, but no structure but maybe you don't need it in other places, but it's cheap and easy for the, arch for the structural engineer to draw it, but it costs a lot of money for the client to pay for it and a lot of money and time for us to build it. And so paying attention and getting a structural engineer that works to value engineer your projects and works to get your project in budget is super important. And typically what we've seen is that if you hire the cheapest structural engineer, you're gonna get a guy or a woman who uses the same details for every project. And so they're gonna put big beams in every window and door and big beams over every place that they have any kind of load as opposed to a structural engineer that spends their time to design that specific member, that specific wall, that specific beam to account for the load that it's going to encounter during the lifetime of that project. And that way that value engineering dramatically reduces the cost of production and, and building that structure, meaning that you can spend your money in other places like increased insulation or more durable materials or materials that don't off-gas into the indoor, indoor environment, uh, making your project much more cost-effective and efficient, or you just may not have to spend that money at all and you can build a project for less. So if you're interested in learning more about building science or following these projects with Pat or other projects of ours, or if you're just interested in green building, hit subscribe as we show you how we build a better way.